All right. Yeah, just nonstop. It's cold as crap here, and my heater's been yeah, blasting. I, I looked at what the uh, temperature was in Denver earlier, just so I was curious. It was like, whoa, what it was like for you over there. It's like 12 degrees right now. Yeah. Um, you want to see a picture from my dog walk this morning? Yeah, let me see it. I got a new client. They're cool? Yeah, they're all really cool. My one client just Which got me people? two more clients. They're like, hey, my neighbor wants a walk. And I uh, got their number. So fucking uh, that's awesome. Started walking him, and then he called me Monday. You ready for this story, dude? I got the phone call of my life on Monday. All right. Um. So he called me and said, "Do you board other dogs?" This is my main client. I need to find a better spot for my webcam. I know it's right here. It's all good, bro. I don't know what to fucking do. So he called me and was like, hey, do you board other dogs? And uh, basically, like, I have my friend, my other neighbor, needs someone to board their dog. So are you down with... Because I've been boarding their dogs and why they're one of my main clients. And um, I was like, yeah, give him my number. So I gave him my number. Am I screen sharing with you now? Yeah, I can see it. All right. Come on, you bitch. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's Bowie. Burn a doodle. It's like eight inches of snow. That's nuts. Yeah. It's not that bad, though. It's dry cold once you get moving. It's as long as you got shoes that don't let your feet get cold and you got like a beanie. Oh, yeah, that seems miserable to me. That's so fucking crazy. That's like, they, they were talking about on the news, like it's uh, Armageddon out there with this winter storm passing through. Yeah, and it's like uh, going to get negative six degrees or something tonight. Oh, shit. Meanwhile, down here, it is 73 degrees outside. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so hot. he called me Monday. I was like, I got the, this is the route I always take when I walk. I exit the neighborhood right here. Because to the right, there's an entrance into the neighborhood at a dead end. Super it's, nice neighborhood. Yeah. Back in the day, it was a huge ranch farm. So it's called the Bell, Bell Mansion. What, and it's whatever. just a big subdivision, basically. Yeah, it turned it into a bunch of houses. But there's still a mansion on this lot, this whole acreage, this whole complex. Someone owns it. I think it's just like history property. Yeah. Like a history. I don't know if anybody lives there. Maybe. So, uh, he called me Monday and I don't ever talk to him. I'm in touch with his wife, Erica, cause she's mm -hmm. hired me. So I'm always texting her about scheduling and updates and this and that. So I, I hardly ever hear from him, but I see him all the time and he's cool, but he called me Monday and I was like, fuck. What happened? You know, that's my thought. Like, did the yeah. dog, because I just boarded them. I had brought them back the day before and I had walked them right before, like a few hours before. So I was like, fuck, maybe I fed them something and now they're dead. Mm -hmm. that, how fucking horrible. Oh, dude. But he called me. He was like, hey, uh, basically what I just said, he, you know, can I give this guy your number? Will you board the dog? So, and then he said, uh, do you, and I haven't told anybody this. I've told my mom, my dad and Ford. Ooh, so I'm in, I'm in privileged territory here. Yeah. I just don't want to like talk about it. Like it's a real thing, but I'll share it with a few people. So then he says, do you want to own a small doggy hotel? And I didn't really understand him, but I thought I did. So instead of saying, huh, like an idiot, I was, I, I was like, do, do I want to own a small doggy hotel? He was like, yeah. It's like, well, yeah, that'd, that'd, that'd be awesome. That's kind of what I would like to do. Um, I, I don't remember exactly. And you're, really what I, in, and you're really into this. You're really into like boarding dogs. and Yeah, I've been doing it with WAG since I moved here, basically. It's been like half of my income, at least, walking. And then I met my first personal client, and then I walked for her every morning, burn a doodle. And then I met these people I'm talking about here. Yeah. So I wasn't even trying to build this business. I was just hustling this sweet ass 1099 job, you know? Yeah. 
and I, I wound up. So now you're a business owner. Yeah, it's not LLC, it's gigs, but they're my clients. So it's like, it's like, and it's like the majority of my income. And it's, it's like, yeah, it's kind of like I got a little business going all of a sudden. So I was like, um, yeah, I would love to own a dog hotel. Why? What's up? And he said, I'll fund it. And these people are balling. They own businesses and shit. And he's like, I'll fund it. What the fuck? And I was like, long silence. I was like, you, you'll fund it? <laughs> and I'm at Starbucks with Ford. We're just killing time because we're early going meet her friends for dinner, you know? Yeah. So I'm sitting, Ford's looking at me like, what's going on? And I'm like, hold on, you'll fund it? I was like, yeah. And I'm like, what do you mean you'll fund it? He's like, I'll, I'll put the cash up. I was like, whoa. Uh, dude, if you're serious, I mean, I love that idea. Let's talk more tomorrow when I see y'all basically. So that was yesterday. Did you talk to him today? No, I talked to him yesterday. He called me Monday. So yesterday I went to walk the dogs and we met before and he was uh, just, that she, she was telling me, she was like, yeah, so I, I speak really highly of you to anybody. Um, we like you. We trust you. We like what you do. And we just want to help you start your business if you're interested in that. And I was that like, is- and That's I, crazy, dude. I got That's shark, awesome. I got shark tanked, dude, out of nowhere. That is crazy. Yeah, and they're see they're balling. They don't Do go it. to they just Yeah, so the idea is like a 24/7 dog hotel, like boarding and training right. and stuff, but they like what I do because I'm here and I treat the dogs like my dogs. Yeah. And he told me a while back, he said we're lucky to have you because I just don't like boarding because of the lifestyle. So like they like what I, so that's what they are looking at. So I would be there 24 seven. Right. And uh, I had mentioned, cause I thought he was going to think like a warehouse or a shop, like yeah. most boarding places are in. And that's where my mind went. Like if I'm going to be there all the time, I'm going to need a place. I'm going to need a corner. And mainly with music, like what, am I just going to not be able to do that shit anymore? Like I, would love to do this business, but like, as you I had other, a, you had other passions and obviously, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, people run businesses and balance their life and this is a business I love and it would be profitable. So it wouldn't take, it's not like I'm owning a tire shop and it's like, ah, I yeah. just don't have fucking time anymore. You know, it's like the dog boarding is perfect. Cause I'll all be, if I do it the way I want, I'll be home and so will they. Yeah. That'd be awesome. But his idea was to, because I brought up building a studio because I have these other interests in music and I'm committed. And like, if I do this, I'm going to have to be able to have a place where I can still do my, but it came out wrong. Like, oh shit. (laughs) It came out wrong. Like, cause she started asking, well, how much does a studio cost? How profitable is it? What's the market like? And I I was like, you wanted them to finance like a studio. So I had to like, like. I just need a place to personally work where I'm not disturbing the dogs playing fucking drums which and might, recording music yeah. super loud. Which might require me to build, in my mind, you know what I'm talking about. A studio. I know exactly, yeah. But when they think, they think, and ultimately, so I had to like backtrack the conversation and I talked about it too much again, but I was back, I was like, <laughs> I, I wasn't trying to get you to invest. I wasn't trying to get a two for one. I was just saying like, if I'm going to be there all the time, but I his, have a very serious other interest that I need to be able to pursue as well. Yeah. And his original idea, because initially I was thinking warehouse shop and that's I why my mind. I come with you to, to negotiate this business deal, Dylan. <laughs> Dude, yeah, come on. But my, my mind went that direction, but his idea, and it didn't click with me when he said it, because I was still like trying to process all that. Yeah. His idea was to, he was like, I've been, look, I've been looking at houses down the road and I know what area he's talking about. It's basically like the river ranch of this area. So he's looking at buying a big dope house. What? Gutting the inside. What? 
They like, spared. They just gutted the house that they like. Whenever I started walking for them, they were on the other side of the neighborhood. Then they moved to the other side because they started gutting a house, sparing no expense. Heated, what does this dude do for a living? I don't know, but they're super cool. Heated driveway. Their front door is massive and heated it's, driveway, it's, so like the snow doesn't like pile up on it. It just fucking melts. Which the snow was on it today, so maybe it's not working. But they're. No. Yeah, so that's what he's talking and leaving a living quarter to stay in because he gets the idea. So like my mind didn't catch that. So like basically all that stuff I was talking is solved in his model. So yeah. like I just need a living. And there, I was like, what about my wife? Can she come? And she was like, well, yeah, you don't want her to go. I was like, <laughs> so we're, we're just going to move into the basement of this dope gutted huge house. And I'll just give you like equity. Well, because they got all the clients. That's why he's bringing it up. Because yeah. like, he, he was telling me, he was like, this whole neighborhood has the same dates we have. Spring break, summer, Christmas. All the Dude, walking, all the that's boarding. That's awesome, bro. What the fuck? And then I was talking to her after the dog walk because I was thinking about all the studio shit I said. So I was thinking like, how can I... Ex- like what, you know, I was thinking a million miles an hour. So when I got back, I was like, Hey, I just wanted to clarify about that studio stuff. And she laughed cause I was talking about it again. I was, like, <laughs> I, didn't, I was like, I didn't mean it like that. I just meant I need like a, but now I realize it's a moot point. Cause that's what they were thinking anyway. It was, that's funny, bro. So she said, yeah, we're not really doing this for us. Like I have my businesses. We just like to help people that we like. That is fucking incredible that there are people like that out there still the fuck i'm sure they'll get like their equity and they'll want it back but i was talking with my dad and he said in the business world if you have a business or property that fails you can hide your taxes or your losses in that and write it off so at worst case scenario for business people that are rolling in dough like that if it fails they can just write taxes off of it and like yeah I guess launder money through it, for lack of a better word. Bro, that's awesome. What? I mean, the maybe f- they are just using you to launder money. I didn't see nothing. <laughs> I didn't see nothing. Isn't that like crazy? Ozark, though, bro. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That's what Ford said. Maybe it's like Marty. What's her name? Uh, Deborah and Marty. Yeah. So maybe it's like on Ozark with Marty. They launder the money. I'm like, maybe so. <laughs> But Who in that cares? Cap- whatever, bro. Because that's what Marty does, bro. He approaches these like, it's like, hey, let me tell you about an idea I have. I'll fund it. Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll spare no expense. I'll do it all for you. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, that's exactly what just happened to you. Yeah. Like, yeah, dude. Uh, studio, 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 studio. Uh, yeah, okay, okay, we don't care. Uh, we're just going to buy this giant house over here. We're just going to live in it. Yeah, got it. Watch our friend's dogs for a few months. So you're technically in business. And then if it fails... And then you come back again, like, so about that studio. <laughs> They're like, we don't give yeah. a fuck. <laughs> you want to invest in some other stuff? I got ideas. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. Well, that's awesome, man. I'm happy for you. Uh, I hope, you know, you follow through with it. and I'll follow through with it. I'm just hoping hope my... they follow through with it. Yeah. That, I mean, it's not set in stone. Even if they back out, I'll still feel really good that somebody... Oh, I was, yeah. was worth investing, dude, gutting a big house and start. That's hundred. They're looking at me and they're like, I'll invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in this guy because yeah. I like the way he takes care of my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> dude, I don't know why it's so funny to me. That shit is crazy, man. But it is just, I don't know, man. Uh, you do a good job with dogs. I know. I know that for sure. So, thanks, ma'am. It's not a question about like how how well you do. I just think of you like this goofy fucker, and they're like, "We'll invest. We'll invest. Uh, you know, three hundred thousand dollars to buy this house over here for you. Um, and we'll gut it. Don't worry about it." My just first thought there. is like, "Where? What about my drums?" <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing you're worried about. I literally was when I thought I was like, how am I going to put my, I wasn't even thinking about where I'm going to sleep being there all the time. I was like, I'll futon in the corner. They'll have a sink somewhere. I can make it work. But <laughs> Bro, that's funny. Yeah. So we'll see well, how that bet, goes. I'm, we'll see how that I'm, goes. I'm excited for you though. That's awesome. Yeah. And then, uh, 
you know, it might actually work better because I'll be in a facility with everything I need right there. Yeah, you won't have to, especially if you can play drums there versus having to rent out like some other space to do it in. And I wrote, I don't even really need to because the whole model is a living quarter. So it's like I just have my practice pads and before hours, after hours. And even while I'm out there, all the dogs are fine. I can just yeah. sit there and just watch them and click my sticks. Hey, hey, hey. And then the dogs stop. You know, it could all work out in a really wonderful way. But I'll keep you updated, see how this goes. That's awesome, man. I'm happy to see you uh, got some stuff brewing on the business front. Thanks, man. It's going to crazy. this big dog hotel empire. You're going to hire me. And when I come out there, I'm going to make, make music uh, with you. Bro, like seriously, because if it goes well, why not <laughs> build this? on your success as a dog walker. <laughs> no, man. that's A rising tide raises all boats. It does. That's my thought process. You know what I mean? Like if something I'm doing blows up, I'm going to try to find out how to involve people close to me that want to be involved. Which gets into the death of skepsis shit we were talking about. Yeah. So you're thinking we just proceed and then like if Neil and Steve are on board, cool. If not, then whatever. We didn't miss a beat. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I mean, literally like if, you know, we're going to finish all the drums and guitars for the old death of skepsis songs, right? Yeah. And if they're not, because I haven't heard from Neil in like six months. And when I, I know do, you had a kid, I know how that is. But it's when I fucking but, stressful. I so. get it. But like before that, he was just like really disrespectful and dismissive more than once. So that personally, I started to realize I don't think we're really buddies. I'm just going to leave him alone. And if I hear, if I hear from him, I hear from him, but I don't fucking ever. We're grown, man. We don't have to text back and forth about bullshit. But like yeah. personally, I can see that's fine. But then also professionally, I've been mega burned. Like when I went to Texas, I didn't even yeah. go see my family. He did two takes, burned me, said he had plans with his girlfriend, just left me hanging in a hotel. Like, what the fuck? So like when it comes down to death of skepsis and what I see, we talked about that before, but like, no way I'm even, like as a man. Yeah. Anybody you disrespected that, like that. Yeah. You are not obligated to extend any kind of olive branch anymore, you know? So I'm not yeah. cutting anybody off. I'm just moving on because I'm in it to win it. And so are you like, we're on that level. And then people that aren't, we don't deserve to have our process impeded by people yeah. that, and if they're not on that level, then why would they give a fuck if we move on? Uh, if, if, I mean, know, so, I, the other thing is like, how often are they practicing? And I don't mean to, to have this talking shit about them, but how often are they practicing their craft? Like, how often do you think Steve is picking up a bass? And how often do you think Neil is actually practicing vocals? Never. And I know that for a fact and, because Neil. So for me, that's a big problem. Yeah. I mean, I haven't never, I've never stopped. You've never stopped. Yeah. You know, play every fucking day. You do too. You know, so, so other side of that is like, all right, like, we're trying to recreate, you know, some magic that we had back in 2007, 2008, you know, nine or whenever we were all together, but it's not going to be the same anyway, because, you know, back then they were putting in the time and the hours and the effort and the energy and practicing and honing their skills constantly. Now they're not. And, you know, I don't want to play in a sloppy band, period, you know, um, I have a reputation to uphold as a musician for other projects that I'm in and working on. Right. So whatever. I mean, yeah. Like our work shouldn't. Yeah. I don't want to suffer. Have, yeah. Have sloppy ass takes, yeah. you know, that I'm not happy with that. My, I'm not happy with my name going on the shit, you know, and not to say that they would, but I'm just, it, that's the nature of just anything challenging like playing an instrument like you have to do it consist it's not a knock on them you just have to do it consistently to stay sharp man like yeah. i know me personally when i go if i go a fucking a uh, couple uh, if i go a week without playing guitar like i notice a difference in my playing ability mm -hmm. it just is what it is so could you yeah. imagine going a year two years three and years we live in different states so we gotta be ready when we show up for a show yeah 
and that's yeah. possible, but there's half of the band that doesn't do their homework. And right. back to the practicing, like I've been, I don't know how many hours I've spent on Death of Skepsis stuff so far in the last three years, but every thousands. hour, close, to, maybe not, but maybe not, not thousands, but like hundreds. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and every hour was an hour I could have been at work. So I took a financial yeah. hit and I'm That's willing true. to invest that. Like I literally ended a lot of months behind because I wound up carving out a total of a week and a half because I was on a roll. Yeah. And I have the word of the other people. Like what I'm getting at is when I first started, I was having to get the tabs and turn them into MP3s. So I had this whole thing where I like spent hours at Joe's house when I should have been at work for like three or four days in a row, like three or four hours a day. Yeah. Just to organize the tabs, make sure we got everything. Here's all the tabs, the tabs, the tabs, that's that new old concepts, getting it all ready. And then I plugged it the eighth inch into the recording interface with an adapter and sat there and recorded each one onto its own huh. track and then bounced them all into MP3 so that Neil and Steve-O and us could have it, right? Right. Because that was step one. Once everybody was like, cool, let's do it. I was like, all right, I got on it. And I gave everybody, Neil, yeah. you know what? Steve-O never fucking, I don't think he ever fucking opened anything. But Neil... After I sent it to him, I was like, what's your email address for Dropbox? He said, I can't get in. I lost my password. Can you just email them to me? And so I got to sit there and share it with <laughs> y'all. Like, figure out a way to do. Yeah. And then these songs are too big. They were waves. So right. I had to do it all again as an MP3. MP4 or MP, yeah. So I can upload two songs at a time in an email. And you send 16 different emails. And trusting a guy that doesn't want to go through all that and organize it. You know what I'm saying? And I, he's, and you know what he told me? I can't practice with that. I need the final sound. I can't practice unless I have the, so all that oh Neil threw it in the fucking trash can and Steve-O so, never cares because real quick, I'm just going to wrap this up with Steve-O. I've been going back and forth with him on projects, silly rap songs, country songs, and he gave me his word. Let's do it. Yeah. So this is how I know Steve-O doesn't practice. Because over the last three to four years, I have sent him the same project three or four different times a year apart because I gave him that much time until I followed up. Like, hey, are you going to do that song you said? Oh, I forgot. Send it again. So I have to go retrieve the project again because it's been a year. Find it in my backups. Bounce it. Compress Whatever the fuck. Upload it over the course of three and a half years, and I've never fucking gotten anything back on four or five different projects as well as the podcast I launched with this this summer the video game which took fucking hours just to launch it to make the artwork to edit still doing that no because I don't fucking hear from him he just disappeared on everything so that's fine you don't want and you don't want to do but it's extremely disrespectful to give your word and another man that has a life like you is investing time and you don't even, if you don't want, you don't want. It, yeah. yeah, like that's, because like, in their mind, I don't, I'm not respected. I'm doing something that is like a game and they're too busy. And it's like, I'm busy too and it's not a game. Yeah, and we're then, all adults. And, and then Neil says, enjoy the process, man. Don't stress. And it's like, you're fucking not a part of the process you're holding it back. That's why I'm stressed. I love the fucking process. So I, on the other hand, they think it's a game. I, on the other hand, am taking a real hit every time I do this. And I don't mind. Just show up. Yeah. That's no, it. You, you are you are the like the linchpin of all of it. And you have taken for sure a financial hit for it. And which kind of goes back to you know, we've had this discussion in the past and we're, we'll, we'll start soon because I know we got some content we want to get in for the podcast, but do we even still call it death of skepsis? There's I mean, my we use the songs, use the content. I'm not saying throw that away. I'm saying why call it death of skepsis still? It's not like I'm sure maybe some of our fans from back in the day still remember us, but like 
things move so fast, especially nowadays, like, I don't know, like, I feel like we could just call it something else. We don't have, since it's two, two people that, and I'm not even one of the original members. Right. So for me, it was always a little weird, but it shouldn't be. I know, I but it always felt, the I know, but it felt that way because like y'all were a band for years before I joined. Yeah, but you completed it. That whole time we needed a fifth guy and there was nobody. And then now, Jesse showed up and you just fit right like a Power Ranger. So I never saw you as like the new guy. I appreciate extra guy. that, man. I always saw you as the guy we never had that we needed. Yeah, I appreciate that. But still, you know, um, I don't know. Here's my thing about Death of Skepsis. I feel what you're saying, and I'm down to do a new name and a new project. Yeah, keep the content. And just... But like... As we write newer shit, it's not tied to that Death of Skepsis name. You know what I mean? Right, but also that puts us at a disadvantage. We're the ones getting after it. We are Death of Skepsis. Without... They're replaceable. We're not. Like, we are Death of Skepsis. Like the early November, he has different musicians now. There's only two original members, new records, tours. Yeah. It's still the early November because Ace and that other guy are the two that show up and make it fucking happen. The other guys are the ones that don't. So we shouldn't have to change our name and start new at a disadvantage because other members have been holding us back, right? And I'm down with, because we're going to release like 23 Death of Skepsis songs. And then we're just going to like turn into Polybius or we could stay death of Skepsis. Cause if here's if Neil and Steve-O show up, it's death of Skepsis. And here's what I was saying. If we do the whole two piece death of Skepsis shit and they don't show up, let's publish all the death of Skepsis songs as two piece instrumentals. That's what it is right now. That's yeah, what death of that. Skepsis is. Right? And I'm, I'm, I want to, like, I want to document get Jai, that. I just get Jai to do vocals on them and I'll do the bass. <laughs> You know, if Neil and Steve-O don't show up and that's the, that's the route we want to go, I'm down. But I'm, 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 I'm of the mind, like, publish it as a two-piece. I don't give a fuck. Let's get it out there. The songs are other songs. We can play them live. If me and you start playing that's Polybius, people are going to request Birdman. They're going to request Sailor Mouth. Let's fucking crush it. So it's like, I totally get what you're saying, rename it. But I'm also of the mind, like, it doesn't matter. Why, sh why should we have to? Fuck it. Yeah. Because we're, okay. we're going to release 23 Death of Skeptic songs anyway. We're going to know all that. Why not play a show, instrumental two piece versions, of, and then move forward from there as Death of Skeptic? You know, like. Yeah. It's like either way, but I'm actually down for just keeping it Death of Skeptic. And if anyone's got a. Because if we push, if we release all those two piece songs, here's the other part. Let's say we get there. And I don't hear from Steve or Neil, uh, which I don't expect to. And if I do, I'm going to be real cautious to be like, hey, man, are you still down? I just spent 2,000 hours doing all this work. Uh, I know you fucking left me hanging all the other times, but uh, I'm going to trust you getting you down. You know, like if you can't trust somebody with the small things, you can't trust them with the big things. Yeah. And that's where I'm at because me and you are in it to win it. And we're on that level and we're going for it. And like we don't need to be held back. You know what I mean? It's not the personal, it's just like, because here's the thing, it's going to take me a while to do the drums. So take some investment, to pay for a drum studio, editing, buying drum heads. I'm going to be invested. Yeah. I'm going to get it done. And then I'm going to send you the stuff and you'll so get it done. I'm going to have to do the tra the guitar tracks and do, and fucking get those super tight cutting, you know, yeah. and fucking getting all that extra shit. It's to get it perfect. You, you can know. just, I mean, you can just do your takes and then send me the project. I can crossfade and all that shit. But like, okay. we might have to go back and forth. I might be like, Hey, um, redo this part. Yeah. Like the gain stage is a little low compared to like the second song. It was much louder. Like, okay. And then you dial it in. So then like maybe that song redo at the end. Cause the first one, the first pancake never comes out right. You know? Yeah. That whole concept, and that's but yeah, not, and then reamping and all the other shit that goes with it, right? So. Later on, when we get the sounds, and fucking, so let's say you do all your guitars, which you will, but let's say you 
fucking carve out time. Tiffany is doing more with the baby than she wants to. You're like, fuck, I'm doing this a lot. You don't have to pressure yourself like that, you know, but carving out time's carving out time, making it happen. Yeah, making yeah. it happen. Carve out time. So you let's say you time to do this type of shit. Let's say you fucking bust ass and you do all your guitars within a year, which is possible, but it's a lot of guitars. So maybe not. But even so, like, we'll have something to release by the, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then let's say I send all this to Steve-O and it's two years and I haven't gotten anything back. And me, <laughs> me and you busted our fucking ass because we we're in it to win it. And now we're being held back pushing 40 years old and we've gotten half of Steve-O's bass reluctantly because he doesn't like it when I correct the tracks, which need to be perfect going back to all the five years I've spent learning how to do this. Yeah. Like there's a certain way to engineer and there's a certain way to edit, mix and master. And it's like back to sloppy players. Like our show shouldn't suffer because they're not doing me and you are crushing it, but Neil's voice gives out and Steve, O's like fucking up all the notes. Like, all right, thanks for ruining the comeback. We were fucking ready. And it's the same with the CD. Like, I've been doing this shit so much and you can't even get me, you can't even like just communicate with me. Yeah, about, just let like, you know what's up. Gain, just like, let hey, you know what's up. Just yeah, let you know what's up. That's really yeah, it. It clipped right here, the gain stage. Can you like maybe redo that and then like, get ghosted for a week? And I'm like, all right, let me just give them more time so I don't, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like that's yeah. not the game I'm trying to play. So I'm of the mind. Let's just, you know, move on. The ship's leaving. Say the ball is in their court, both personally and professionally. You feel what yeah. I'm saying? I feel what you're saying. I love those dudes. With no, no, Me too. I have no hard feelings towards either one of them. I don't want to. I don't either. I want I don't. them for the best for everything in their life. And like I said, I know, especially with Neil, like having a new baby, like that shit's that shit's hard. Like, yeah. I get it. I get it. I have that right now too. It's fucking not easy. Like my time is always scheduled now. Like yeah. I have like everything I do is scheduled. And I'm not like a this, dick and I don't is push you about you know? nothing. I don't push you and I might I remind try to, you. And I, I, you know, I fuck up. I'm not perfect. I, I wouldn't even say you quick. fuck up. I say Jesse shows up. It's I not like a show up. The only time I bring out receipts is after three or four years when I've been completely butt fucked and yeah. totally not acknowledged. Then I'm like, Hey, you know what? Moving on without them, this is why. I get it. So, so, well, cool. We're in agreement there then. Yeah. We're and then once we forward. So, like, while we're tracking all the Death of Skepsis songs, we can chip away and write Vulture Stone and B modes. Yeah. And well, then, those are written, but I get what you mean. But yeah. We can do that too and like start fucking, you know. I mean, all the hundreds of hours I spent doing tabs. Yeah, that's, and that's not fucking easy. I know that. And that's, <laughs> yeah, and that was for me because I got a Mac and I need to practice. And also for you because you got a Mac, not a PC. But yeah. also for Steve-O because he's got a PC, but also a Mac. But like, I've never heard from Steve-O anything about tabs. Like, if you're in it, wouldn't you be like, hey, I, uh, what's the deal with recording? been practicing for a year we do you know something or like even know. just maybe not but like i i speculate that because the projects i have sent to him i've gotten nothing back so about practicing like if steve was practicing and doing his thing it would be nothing just to whip up a dumb bass line for a hip-hop song and do some sit like he told me you would yeah that's all i mean if you told me you would i spent the time doing it and you show no interest don't even acknowledge it damn it's like, you know, I get the hint. I get the hint. I'm the mayor of get the hintsville. That's what's going on. But that's the end of my my message. Moving on. You know, they might be uh, listeners of this podcast. They might get the message. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Either. Like we talk about them spending time. I'm sure they just spent 30 minutes listening to us <laughs> rant about them. And like with Steve O, me and him had some political disagreements when he said he was voting for Biden and he thought Biden was a good choice and the crime law is a good thing. And uh, he's oh, gonna make shit. he's gonna make weed legal. And that was just and then he gets he cross checks with Politifact. So we just had disagreements and I was like, Politifact's a propaganda machine. Biden's not gonna do anything. They're super corrupt. And his response was, I have family 
that was also into QAnon and voted for Trump. So like I understand that thinking. And I was like, oh, shit, dude, that's you what I'm saying. Q QAnon. Just that's what I'm saying, disagree. man. Like someone has like, all right, well, you're automatically in the far like right crazy column. He, li I, I literally never said anything about pro Trump or QAnon. He, he said that, like he inferred it. And I was like, dude, is this real? And then that's whenever he started like ignoring me a lot and then not showing up. So I honestly think. Steve-O decided, just like Jareth decided. At this, oh, Jareth decided that as well? Before I moved, Jareth fucking, it was my birthday, and I was like, he, got, he was being like a sassy bitch because we were hanging out all weekend at his part with Steve-O. He mm -hmm. was literally being a sassy bitch to me. It's really weird, but I didn't say anything. So then we went, it was my birthday, and I left his apartment. I was like, so we're going to watch the fights tonight? It was Stipe Miocic when he knocked out Arlovsky. He's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll be there. He never showed up, and I never fucking heard from him in my life. In my life. He just fucking dropped me like a bad habit. Damn. And Steve-O's kind of doing the same thing, and Steve-O's always like, I'm, we're family, we're buddy. So I think as like a loyal... I'm not making conspiracies. I know him pretty well, and I know how our personal inter interactions have been going, and when I started getting ignored and not acknowledged, and so like, all right, I won't... Every time we talk, like, at some random point, he just, like, ignores me. I don't know why. But, like, you know, when people, like, I, when people start saying, like, very few words and they're just being really short. Yeah, like, not, obviously trying to not engage in a conversation. That's what I'm getting at, yeah. And, like, I just assume Steve-O thinks I'm a QAnon QAnon Trumper who gets his information from quote unquote crackpot scientists in the backwoods because of some of the stuff I was sharing with them. And it's like, he shared with me a podcast and I listened to it and I commented. I was like, that's cool. I've shared with him a lot of podcasts and he just fucking, I just don't think he's ever listened. I think he's already like lumped me up as this kind of a guy. Right. Media Roots with Abby Martin, Jimmy Dore, you know, like yeah. good interviews. And it's like, he's, he just doesn't engage personally to be fair we do have a conspiracy po podcast it's research based it's, it is re yeah we don't talk about like we're not ranting about flat earth yeah we're screen sharing what we've researched and he knows we have a podcast so i think he really lumped me up as like because he told me like some of the information i was talking to him about i was like i heard it on interviews on a podcast but he said, my ex-girlfriend who's crazy has a podcast that doesn't mean what she says is true. It's like, first off, for you to think that's what I'm listening to and would believe is extremely fucking disrespectful. Right. Second, you don't know what the fuck I'm talking about if you don't understand that independent journalism and media is in the podcast world, not PolitiFact and the CNN graphs and all this CIA talking point stuff, you know? Yeah. But I don't no, judge him. I'm not dropping him like a bad habit. It's like... So that's my so he take. Probably, he probably thinks I'm like, uh, uh, just because I'm on the podcast with you, you probably automatically guilty yeah. by association. So he probably thinks yeah. I'm a right wing QAnon believer yeah. as well. And I which never even, I am definitely not. I never even brought that stuff up, but he brought it up. Like, oh, I, I know people who think like you, my family, they're QAnoners and Trump supporters. It's like, you are missing the fucking ball here, buddy. So I think that's no, part of what sad, man. aided and people would just quit talking to you because of a difference in ideologies. And I know Neil's We've busy with the kid and shit. Such a long time. I know Neil's busy with the kid and shit, but he fucking before he had a kid when he was with the girl before this girl, he fucking burned me and disrespected me hardcore. So like Yeah. Again, yeah. end of my message. But yeah, death of skepsis, polybius, whatever we do. Let's just move on. Let's move forward. Let's just power forward. Okay. Yeah. Power forward. All right. We'll do. So um, should, uh, should speaking I of like all negative shit, the doomsday clock still 100 seconds to midnight. Oh, yeah. The doomsday clock is 100 seconds to midnight. Do you have the article to share? Um, I, I, got, I got it. Which I article? It. I mean, I have I got the it. actual right page from the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. I got it right here. Um, okay. So the Whatever. doomsday clock was updated recently. 
It wasn't yeah. updated. It stayed the same. It did stay the same as last year. Lion sack of shit. Um, in 2020, it got moved to 100 seconds to midnight. And in 2021, it's still at 100 seconds to midnight because it we're still um, in the same... I forget what they how, what they uh, stated, but there was a particular thing they said that I, I uh, oh, it's right there in front of me. Because of the alarming rise of online misinformation, yeah. that's one of the reasons that it's 100 seconds to midnight, by the way. Yeah, so I saw the propaganda in the article. I was like, oh, that's yeah. interesting. I get the climate change stuff. You know, I get the ramping up of the nuclear arsenal stuff. Uh, I just thought it was very interesting to include that third piece of online misinformation. Yeah. Um, basically, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists is who runs the doomsday clock. They are called the timekeepers. And it turns out the clock is not an actual prediction. It's just an indicator of how close we are to destruction according to the bulletin of atomic scientists right so, so there's it's years where it's a, a, a committee of scientists that basically yeah. get together once a year di discuss the state of three different categories and then based on like the consensus they come up with they set a time on the clock yeah and it can move backwards too yeah i thought it was funny like when the clock was introduced in 1947 uh they chose the seven minutes to midnight just because they like the way it looked on the clock. <laughs> Did you know that? The seven minutes to midnight thing? Yeah. Yeah, I read that and I thought there that was... I, I, I immediately think there's more to the reason than that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. But like that's what they said. It just looked good on the clock. Yeah. Which is not that... Scientific. Yeah, it's not that indicative. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It looks good right there. That, that's perfect. Yeah. Um, the BAS, Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, introduced the Doomsday Clock in 1947. You just said that. During the Cold War, decades that followed the U.S. and the Soviet U Union, along with other nations, produced and stored hundreds of atomic weapons, and the clock's time jumped two minutes to midnight in 1953, after the detonation of the first hydrogen bombs. Russia currently possesses more than 6,000 nuclear warheads. The U.S. has 500. 5,500. 5,500, as well as the United Kingdom, China, France, Pakistan, India, Israel, North Korea, according to the Orms Control Association, uh, who estimated that in 2021. So, Damn, the U.S., man, we, we, we're down by 500, man. We need to get our, our shit together and catch up with Russia. We need another 1,000 nukes stat. Yeah, Ugh. dude. Man, can you understand. imagine if they all like went off like a like a tent of fireworks? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the, I hope there's safeguards in place that uh, make sure that never happens. But it seems yeah, like if they all be a world-ending event, dude. It seems like it would literally split the earth like a it like may. a sledgehammer, and you drive that wedge in, and it splits the log. Just like in a bunch of different spots, though, because you have it over here in Russia, the U.S., you have it in Europe, right. China. So it's just like a bunch of nails being driven in from different spots. Oh, man. It would, we would blow the planet up. It would be uh, these different rocks that are just kind of orbiting the sun now. And then we have inter... It creates new planets, essentially. And then we have inter-Earth planetary wars between the different rocks. Whoa. Talk science, about breaking Pangea. Dude, that is. That's fucking awesome. Dude, you need to write an Illuminati telegraph novel. Just I like it could be about that. You'll just write fiction stories based on worst case scenarios. Anyway, like, um like so, at the end of the book, the 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 star of the book discovers that it's not multiple rocks; it's different planes, and the Earth is flat. And then it's the end of the book, and it's flat gotta, and hollow. Yeah, you got to read part two. <laughs> <laughs> got the next book coming out. Anyway, um, so what time is it, Jesse? It's now 100 seconds to midnight. When setting the doomsday clock each year, the BAS, or Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, asks two important questions. Is humanity safer or at greater risk this year compared to last year? And is humanity safer or at greater risk this year 
compared to the 75 years we've been asking the question, with a focus on man-made threats, nuclear risk, climate change, and new disruptive technologies. This is a, uh, I think we're getting into the propaganda part. Let me the see. Propaganda part. I just noticed because they, they obviously put those buzzwords in there to scare people. This is the girl that wrote the article. Mm, that looks like a very um, legitimate, astute person that's, uh, I, I trust her. She says a trustworthy look to her, Dylan. Yeah, yeah, right. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Uh, the doomsday clock time reflects the continued spread of COVID-19 pandemic, which has killed about 5 million people and an estimated 30 million deaths have gone unreported. Do you believe those numbers? Where are they? How are they estimating this 30 million deaths that have gone unreported? See, when I read numbers like this, I wonder if they're... Um, counting. I mean, I'm I'm sure we can easily find like the the, the COVID death count, right? But I, I'm curious about the 30 million unreported, and in that five million that you are reporting, and I'm Dylan. I didn't mean to cut you off, man. I'm sorry. You're good. Go, I got I got a lot of talking to do today. Take it um, away. Yeah, and this this five million that are reported hasn't the CDC come out recently saying something along the lines of, you know some of the deaths that are reported to be of COVID were actually deaths of people with COVID, not necessarily because of COVID. Yeah. There's uh, the medic who gave me my IV last year over here. He's not conspiratorial. And he said in the Denver hospital, he knows for a fact he saw it happen marking deaths as COVID deaths and they were trauma deaths. That's a real thing. And as like, long as you test positive with COVID, they can mark it as a COVID death. Yeah, yes. like there's people with that died from gunshot wounds that they had COVID, and so they put it as a COVID death. So it just depends on where you get information from. It's just, if it's like an independent media source who's actually reporting on stuff that gets you banned or a website yeah. that... I'm, I'm just always skeptical when I see these insane numbers because there's no way <laughs> 5 million just regular people walking around got COVID and died, you know, like they all had an average of 4.0 comorbidities, underlying issues. Right. We know all this. So I like how the world health organization has this big, pretty graphic of, uh, the confirmed cases and the deaths on their site. It's very you interactive too. You want to share it? Oh, sure. I mean, Throw I'm sure people there. have seen it. I'll keep reading this. Um, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientist Board Member Asha George, Executive Director of the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense, said that. Oh. So this the World Health Organization's page on coronavirus. So globally, uh, as of 7-15, February 2nd, there have been 380 million confirmed cases, including 5.6 million deaths, almost 5.7 million deaths. And as of uh, the 31st of January, there have been 9.9 .9 billion vaccine doses administered. Is that right? Yeah. How many billion people are in the world? Well, I guess if everybody gets two doses. Oh, plus boosters. okay, 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 okay. That makes sense. I was like, 9.9 .9 billion? Does that mean everyone in the world is vaccinated? Like, I mean, how many of that 5.6 million people who died are trauma victims, are people with Ooh, all the well, underlying issues. How many of those COVID cases of 380 million are actually people who tested positive after getting the vaccine? There's a guy at my work who got the booster and he was not at work last weekend because he's fucked up from the booster. And he was, nice. and he got COVID weeks before and was blown because mind blown because he had the vaccine. This dude, his body is fucked right now. Is he generally healthy? No. He's like a drink a lot, depressed kind of guy. Like, you know, you should get some sunlight there, Kevin. You should get some sunlight and mm. try to hydrate, Kevin. I see. You know what I'm saying? Probably extremely low levels of vitamin D. Yeah. Doesn't take his vitamins in general. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but not to get on a COVID rant. 
Yeah, yeah. So, well, they're kind of now. talking about it here. Yeah, I know. So, quote, we've seen governments around the world recognize the true impact of their failure to respond appropriately to COVID. Hundreds of millions of cases and the millions of deaths that we've seen as a result of this pandemic. Here in the U.S., I believe the new administration is trying to turn the tide. But there was so much damage done in our initial response. Blame it on Trump. I think it's proven very difficult. COVID-related disinformation also fueled the spread of the disease, leading people to reject scientifically proven methods for reducing transmission, like the vaccine that works so well and crippling the authority of health officials like Fauci to enforce mask wearing and social distancing, which, which doesn't work. Ma that mask, mask wearing doesn't work, apparently. That yeah, well, in 95. What works is air ventilation. We covered that a while back. Um, yeah, I don't know about the vaccine, like how much good it does versus how much harm. I don't know, but... Oh, and listen to this one. Each year that human activities continue to dump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it nearly irreversibly ratchets up the toll of human suffering and ecosystem destruction arising from global climate disruption. So here you have this narrative being reinforced about its people. But did you know that the Pentagon is the largest contributor to yeah, man-made climate Abby change? Martin. Yeah. And Abby Martin's a journalist who has a podcast because she's not welcome on mainstream sites. But I get my information from crackpots in the woods and I'm a Trump supporter. It's like this continued, but this is like propaganda. So when you bring up propaganda, people don't want to admit they're lied to. It's like, dude, you're being lied to. Us driving to work. People just have so much trust in institutions. I know. It is wild All you got to do is and read some of the stuff we're going to talk about. You just look at history. Look at yeah. just immediate post-World yeah. War II, which we're going to get into yeah. right when this doomsday clock was founded. Yeah. There was so much fuckery going on. That is like Dude. proven to be fact now, now that all these people are dead and can't be held responsible for it. But people just think like, oh, that was back then. That's not happening today. This yeah. type of shit isn't going down today. Of course it's not. Our government's doing nothing but but really good things to protect us. Dude, Biden's crime law fucking <sighs> I was I was shown a graph about Biden's crime law. Real quick and it was like a, right. it was from CNN and this person was saying that the crime law was good because like incarcerations went down. So the graph showed incarceration is going down. But that's relative to the total number of encounters because it was a three strike law. On the third strike, you get incarcerated, but you get fucked when you get incarcerated. It's like prison time, like a motherfucker. So it didn't reduce the incarcerations. It made them harsher. It just reduced the ratio by a third now. So it appears mm. to have dropped. You feel what I'm saying? You feel mm -hmm. where I'm going? Because Biden's crime law versus does not... people like turning in and out, like getting arrested for one or two days, and then getting let go. Now you yeah. know they get three chances, and on that that third one, bitch, you're it, going to jail for like six years. Yeah, and then there's that that churn rate goes down of them in and out of prison. So it looks as if there's less crime. Right. Right. Mm. And it took me a while to think about that because I was shocked to see a graph that went against what real journalists know. Like, I don't hear anybody reliable talk. I've never heard anybody talk about Biden and his crime laws in a good way. Anybody reliable, unless it's right. CNN. So anyway, institutions and corruption. Um, so I think that's about it. Yeah, that's about it on clock. the doomsday clock. So let's, I, so I, I got a couple, we're talking about a oh, couple ahead. more things just to look at. Um, okay. Yeah, like we said, in 1947, nuclear scientists and other experts uh, acted as timekeepers, and uh, they made the doomsday clock in 1947. 1947, 1947. Um, this is kind of a similar article, but but this right here you'll be surprised the origin of COVID. did people or nature open pandora's box at wuhan remember that long article lab leak versus origin theory we covered mm -hmm. this is it and it's from the bulletin of atomic scientists so when i was getting skeptical i was surfing their website and i found that article so i was like holy shit wow they do put the truth out there it's just the factions that curate information don't allow it through you know what i'm saying yeah 
Like this article is not going to be shared all over. It's just going to sit that's here. That's on their website. Yeah, man. Remember this long intro. The virus that caused the pandemic is known as SARS-CoV-2, but can be called SARS-2 for short. And it goes into the tale of two theories. Remember that? Mm, yeah. Ringing, ringing some bells. No shit. Yeah, that's from the bulletin, man. The bulletin.org. That and it talks it. about Peter Daszak. Yeah, the whole yeah. nine yards. So all that is on this website. So it's interesting how like... Well, they're calling out the media's bullshit right here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, maybe this is a... Is a we, I don't know. In my research, I didn't come to the conclusion that this was not a legit organization. Me neither. You know? And let me just say that what caused me to be skeptical in the first place was the fact that the doomsday clock exists. How weird. What do people know that they make that? And that it was made in 1947. So maybe we should get into all the other shit yeah. that happened in 1947. Let's, do it. Let's um, do it. Albert Einstein was also part of the original <laughs> Bulletin Bulletin. of Atomic Scientists. Yeah, like here's a list of all the names. The founder and first editor was biophysicist Eugene Rabinowitz, which is this guy, a Russian-born American biophysicist who is known for his work in photosynthesis and nuclear energy. And I clicked on all these names, and honestly, I didn't find anything like I didn't find an while. Alan Dulles yeah. or a you know me either. I also went through these names. That's why I was like, I don't really see anything. But you got Einstein here. here. Where's his name? Got Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer. Yeah, just trying to be fair. I didn't really find anything like that. Um, but their merch store is pretty legit, dude. Did you see their, <laughs> their merch, merch store? I'm serious, dude. Let me show you. They got some good merch. Home Arts Store. Check it out, man. Shop the store. Bro, give me a Doomsday. But yeah, give me give me one of those shirts, dude. Oh, I'm about to give me a discount from Honey on the Doomsday website. Oh, shit. Dr. Doomsday. Yeah, man. It's hilarious that they actually have a <laughs> fucking merch store. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> They're making bank. Yeah, they just need a podcast. That actually would per be a pretty cool podcast. Yeah. That's an Apple. Oh, it's an Apocalypse watch. I was like, that's an Apple watch shirt? Where? This one? one you, no, right next to it, to the right. That Those one. are the three little rings. Nope. Left. That one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe these are made by like, like people. Watch. People submit art and they use it on. Oh, uh, I wonder if the people themselves get paid Maybe. for this. I wonder if these this con consortium of scientists are the ones who are prof profiting off this merch store. Trust science. I'm going to get that shirt. And I'm a double mask. No, I'm a not mask. I'm going to not mask and I'm going to wear that shirt. <laughs> um, Doomsday clock virus. That's cute. Yeah, man. They got some pretty cool. I like their oh, shirts, man. There we go. We got some masks. Yeah, man. I like their shirts. Got a mug. Trust science mud. Hold leaders accountable. Hell yeah, dude. I want to get Abby Martin's shirt that says end endless wars and it's a picture of a mushroom cloud. You should support Abby Martin so that she can keep doing her independent journalism. I subscribe to their Patreon. Five bucks a month. Fuck yeah. Nice, man. So, um, so I'm going to So what happened in 1947 when this shit was founded? I'm glad you asked. Thanks, man, for uh, for covering me on that. So the reason I'm going to take us on this side trip into 1947 is because my first reaction was the doomsday clock was made in 1947. A bunch of other weird shit happened then too. So after this, I hope anybody listening understands why I immediately think the doomsday clock is skeptical. So let's get into it. All right. In 1947, Israel became an official country. All right. And while I'm doing this, Jesse, feel free to uh, Google search keywords and just keep the screen active and interrupt right, me. Right. Interrupt me and say shit because my voice is going to get annoying. So, uh, so Zionism. Zionism. Not there yet, but yeah, Zionism. Yeah, but that's... Really so there. one of Hitler's right-hand men is named uh, Bormann, General Bormann. And in 1947, Walter Buck, 
the father of Borman's wife declared on his deathbed, quote, that damn Martin made it safely out of Germany because in 1947 became an operation to get all the Nazis out. They fucking all escaped. And I think Hitler did too. Yeah. Something crazy. Like only 14 of them went on trial. Yeah. Is that correct? Like insane. Something like that. I believe Out that. Of like that all, right. Yeah. That sounds right. Now I'm going to Google that while you, while you proceed. Yeah. So in the winter of 1947, a large freighter carrying Borman and several SS officers anchored in the harbor of Buenos Aires, where an organized network of supporters awaited them. So Buenos Aires in Latin America was a big hub. And uh, there's a lot of details here. Each thing I'm talking about gets to a climax. So if you're wondering what the fuck does this have to do anything, just hang on in there. So the means of all these people escaping was a loosely knit collection of escape routes from Europe called the Rat Lines. Chief among these Rat Lines were the Kameraden Work and the Odessa, uh, the Organization der Hamligen SS Angehorigen, or the Organization of Former SS Members. Odessa was created by Bormann and Weller, but later administered by Otto Skorzeny, who escaped war crimes convictions. Documentation of these rat lines is so incomplete and fragmentary that some historians, taking their cue from the corporate world, have denied that Odessa existed outside the fever dreams of fanatical SS men. Ladislas Farago, author of popular histories as well as an acclaimed biography of George Patton, wrote that he had proof of Borman's post-war survival. He acknowledged those deaths existence, but wrote that it was, quote, actually little more than a shadowy consortium of a handful of freelancers and never amounted to much in the Nazi underground. So people are saying not much there, even though they even think Borman escaped. But in 1976, Louis L. Snyder, professor of history at the City College and the City University of New York, produced the Encyclopedia of the Third Reich. Snyder described Odessa as a vast clandestine travel Nazi travel organization to aid the escape of SS members and top Nazis. He noted the main terminal point for Odessa was Buenos Aires. So, South America. Yeah, so according to Farago, Ladislas Farago, the Kameraden work, because there were two factions, Odessa run by Bormann and Mueller and the Kameraden work, a, a German word. That was run by Hans Ulrich Rudel, who was an air ace, lost a leg flying 2,530 combat missions for Germany. After the war, Rudel alone put together one of the most far-reaching and best finance rescue groups, the Kameraden Work. Rudel's group had help, but according to Farago, it did not come from the Borman underground. But are you ready for this, j Dog? The Catholic Church. The vast organization and the enormous resources of the one agency that, in the end, took care of more Nazis than all the others combined. The Refugee Bureau of the Vatican. Yeah, that's why I kind of love doing this podcast because I learned shit. Like, I had no idea that the Vatican were Nazi sympathizers. Right? And even before World War II, they were... Nazi sympathizers, um, you know, when they signed, they originally signed the Treaty of Lateran. The Lateran Treaty. Lateran Treaty. Yeah. Um, which basically was a treaty that recognized the Vatican as a sovereign state um, within Italy, right? Yeah. And gave them, you know, I guess the, the freedom for cover right there, right? Because like as a sovereign country, like my mind went like, when you're able to, to be declared a, a country like that, they kind of can't fuck with you when it comes to laws and things like that. Yeah, like... Um, which but, has enabled all kind of heinous behavior by the Catholic Church, like the hiding of pedophilia and things along those lines, right? Which we're not going to get into today, but... Well, we might. Well, we maybe, might. Maybe, maybe we will. We um, but the Vatican back in the day were so afraid of communism and basically the communism in so the Soviet Union that they would rather part, partner with, fa, 
you know, either fascist Italy or Nazi Germany um, in order to protect themselves against that, right? Yeah. So that is essentially where that relationship was formed at. So I, I just found that fascinating, man. I never knew that connection existed and that the Vatican helped so many Nazis either get to South America or Russia for um, for safety, basically, so that they didn't have to face trial. And then I looked at the Nuremberg trials. I think there were, there's like 24 men, basically, that, that actually went on trial. 24. But there, I'm, there were way more Nazi officers and people that were um, flown down to Argentina. Yeah. Right, where we, we could do a whole podcast episode on that, like the Nazi colonies down there in South America. Yeah. And Soviet Union. And as we'll also get into um, the U.S. and Russia via s intelligence agencies that were scooping up all of the Nazi scientists yeah. via Project Paperclip and Project National Interest. Yeah. 24 people at the Nuremberg trials because according to Wikipedia, 500 Nazi scientists came to America during Operation Paperclip just to build rockets. But in mm -hmm. actuality, it was about 1,600 from biochemical experts to fucking everybody. And that's just what came to America, not the ones that escaped. And at the end of the day, 24 went to trial. So what you were saying, the Italian government in the Lateran Treaty bought favor from the church by paying almost a billion liar in gold as compensation for church property that the Italian government took during the 19th century risorgimento or reorganization that helped create modern Italy. So... On July 20th, 1933, a similar concordat was reached between Pope Pius XI and Nazi Germany. Treaty negotiations were handled by Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli. He signed on behalf of Pope Pius XI, and later, Eugenio Pacelli became Pope Pius XII. This concordat, still in effect today, was signed by Franz von Papen on behalf of German President Paul von Hindenburg. So the two guys running it had two guys signed for them. Von Papen was tried at Nuremberg, but released despite being denounced as a primary mover in Hitler's aggression in Europe. In 1933, there was to be no interference by the church in political affairs. According to the Concordat, the church could not uh, interfere, and interfere with the political world. It also required all bishops to take a loyalty oath to the state and required all priests to be German citizens and subordinate to government officials. Prior to the Concordat's ratification, the Nazi government also reached the similar agreements with the major Protestant churches. So the Italian government was handling up on the Vatican and the Nazi was making deals with Protestant church. Okay, and Hitler grew up in a monastery and strive to reach accommodations with the German churches. He once proclaimed, I believe today that my conduct is in accordance with the will of the almighty creator. These guys really think they're doing good. So yeah. rumors circulated for years that a secret codicil of the Concordat involved papal leniency toward national socialism in exchange for Catholicism being proclaimed the state religion of Europe after an appropriate period of time of total Nazi control. So basically, we're going to run shit. After X amount of time, you'll be the religion of the country. Deal? Right. Got it. Don't say shit. Versus communism where there's no religion. Mm, yeah. Which is what the, what the church feared. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Regardless, it mattered little as Hitler quickly took steps against all churches, including the Catholics. Basically, he started the extermination of the Jews. He, his sterilization laws, attempts to dissolve the Catholic Youth League and arrests of priest nuns and lay leaders all angered the Catholic community. In March 1937, Pope Pius XI issued an encyclical letter titled With Burning Sorrow or Mit Brennen der Sorge. 
In the letter, the Pope accused the Nazis of both violating and evading the Concordat and even foresaw threatening storm clouds of war and extermination. A year later, Pius XI addressed the Nazi persecution of the Jews by proclaiming worldwide, quote, Mark well that in the Catholic Mass, Abraham is our patriarch and forefather. Anti-Semitism is incompatible with the lofty thought which that fact expresses. I say to you, is it impossible? It is impossible for a Christian to take part in anti-Semitism. It's had inadmissible through christ and in christ we are the spiritual progeny of abraham spiritually we're all semites so that became the divide was when hitler started fucking with the jews the church mm. was like god damn it you can't do that man so on february 10th 1939 the day before pius XI was scheduled to deliver yet another scathing public attack on fascism and anti-semitism he died reportedly of a massive heart attack rumors implicated dr francesco severio patacci in the pope's sudden death patacci one of the vatican physicians at the time he worked for the vatican oh wow um well i guess somebody would say well they need doctors at the vatican well, they work for the Vatican, not for the, anyway. Um, he was, Patachi, the, the alleged doctor who killed him, uh, was the father of Clara Patachi, the longtime mistress of Benito Mussolini. The whispers were that Patachi gave the Pope mm. an injection that caused this fatal attack. Strong support for this rumor came years later when the same allegation was found in the personal diary of French Cardinal and former French Army Intelligence Agent Eugene Tisserant. I'm getting up to the main point of this little section here. You're good. So Pope Pius XII took his spot, and he was less antagonistic towards all of that stuff. Similar with Tanzania when that president died. Mm-hmm. We talked about that a few episodes back, and then the person who replaced them played ball. That's what happened here. That's what happened here. Catholic historian and journalist John Cornwell in 1999 released a book called Hitler's Pope. Cornwell explained he originally intended to defend the actions of Pope Pius XII, why he didn't stand up, but in the end wound up getting so much evidence it was more of an indictment. And not only that, um, the author eventually saw that this Pope's actions or inaction actually aided in Hitler's rise to power and the ensuing Holocaust. Needless to say, Cornwell's perception was immediately attacked and he backtracked in 2004 saying, I would now argue in light of the debates and evidence following Hitler's Pope, the book, Pius XII had so little scope of action it's impossible to judge his motives for his silence during the war while Rome was under the heel of Mussolini and later occupied by Germany. So he kind of backtracked. But regardless of the motives, Nazi and SS men escaped Europe with passports issued by Catholic officials. Uh, Rudel, who got his money from the Vatican, said as much in 1970. He said, in Rome itself, the transit point of the escape routes, a vast amount was done. With its own immense resources, the church helped many of us go overseas. All right, so it's going to get a little weird here. Check this out. So one of the clerks who issued these passports, uh, his name was Alois Hudal. He was a friend of Georges Lanz von Liebenfels. Um, he had the same views as Liebenfels, and Liebenfels was a friend of Hitler. Liebenfels published a magazine called Ostara with occult and erotic themes. He was a Cistercian monk who founded the anti-Semitic secret order of the New Templars. His mentor was Guido, Guido von Liszt, who wanted to revive the medieval brotherhood of Teutonic Knights, which were Hitler's heroes when he was young. They used the swastika as an emblem. Liebenfels headed the order of the New Templars, Bishop Hudal, the cleric who issued these passports, was named Procurator General of the Catholic Order of German Knights. Um, 
In his memoirs, Houdal thanked God he was able to help so many escape with false identity papers. Those false identity papers were issued by the Commission Pontificia de Assistenza, or the Vatican Refugee Organization. These Vatican identity papers were used to obtain a displaced person passport from the International Red Cross, which in turn was used to gain a visa. Supposedly, the Red Cross checked the backgrounds of applicants, but usually it was sufficient to have the word of a priest or a bishop. Says the International Committee of Red Cross issued about 120,000 papers until 1951. Oh, 120,000. I don't know that's all Nazis, but that's that's how many papers they... Oh, right, because they were probably issuing legit right. passports like too. Legit, with the legit ones, right. Um, interesting how, like, the Red Cross, but they they do good stuff. So it's like, imagine being alive at this time and somebody's like, the Red Cross is giving passports to Nazis so they can escape. It's like the Red Cross wouldn't do that. They go through a process. It's people passionate about their jobs until the person who really runs shit shows up and points the finger and was like, give them, they're good. They're good. Right. It's like, all right. That's how it's, it's that simple. That's people are like, there's no conspiracy. That's so crazy. Dude, it's super easy. If you're in power, show up and say they're good, you know, like make the word, Hey, can you create like a propaganda news organization and get it on all the stuff around the world? Sure. We own everything right on it, boss. It's like, it's really not that hard if you're in power. Um, for example, well, I can skip that. I'll share a couple of uh, the Nazis who got, who used those uh, Vatican rat lines. I'm just kind of go through a couple of them. So you had Adolf Eichmann, um, who used the name Ricardo Clement. Um, he's basically the man who organized the Holocaust. He fled from Bolzano, which is in Italy, to Argentina in 1950. Uh, his family later joined him. He was so grateful for the Vatican's help in his escape that he converted to Catholicism. Yeah, he worked as oh. an, electric, an electrician at the the Daimler Benz truck factory, and then in 1960 he was kidnapped by the Mossad and then brought to trial in Italy and executed. <clears throat> then you have uh, Joseph Mingle, the who was uh, worked in the Auschwitz concentration camp. Uh, he fled to South Tyrol, Italy, in '49. Uh, where he was provided a new passport with supporters. Uh, his new name was Helmut George, 38, a Catholic and a mechanic who was born in the South Tyrolean village of Tramon. So that was his new identity. Uh, the fact that he was, uh, the detail of his birth in South Tyrol allowed him uh, to be considered an ethnic German as well as stateless. So therefore, he was entitled to an international uh, Red Cross passport. And then he lived in uh, Argentina, Paraguay, Brazil until he suffered a stroke while swimming and drowned. So anyway, there's a, a lot of a lot of these Nazis that um, were basically given these fake papers by the church to move to Argentina and different places in South America, uh, where they lived their lives out happily uh, in these little German communities until they died, essentially. Except for that one guy that was kidnapped by the Mossad. But, yeah. Hmm. Carry on. I know you have a lot more to go. You're good. Thanks for that. That was interesting. Klaus Barbie. I wonder if he invented Barbie to fuck with the heads of... No, that was a butcher of lion. Oh, okay. Oh, even better. With the help of the CIA, Barbie attained a visa for Bolivia. Oh, wow. And they continued to receive orders from the U.S. Foreign Intelligence Service and the German Federal Intelligence Service... His whereabouts became known to the public in 70, and he was extradited to France in 83. He received a life sentence and died of cancer in prison. It strikes me as odd. I never realized the timeline that a lot of these Nazis were alive, like, when I was born. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I kind of overlapped literally with... It wasn't that long ago. It's like a, a grandpa ago. That was it. Yeah, dude. But we, Odessa, the organization run by Borman and Mueller, which reminds me of Robert Robert Mueller. It's spelled the same. The guy who is in charge of the... I don't know if there's relation just because of that, but... Yeah, it was, maybe he's you know, the maybe, grandson. Maybe. You, know, you don't know. Some of these names, though. Um, Odessa, <clears throat> the 
escape program by Boardman and Mueller turned to gun running as a means of financing its operations. Motherfucking goddamn shit. <laughs> Do you hear that noise down there? No. I'm just All right. Curse. All right. Cursing. Um, Motherfucking goddamn shit. Uh, so Odessa was never intended only as an escape route, but at Borman's instructions was set up as a profitable business enterprise as well. All the surplus arms in Europe turned out to be an immediately profitable commodity. In 1945, military order authorities became aware of this uh, enterprise operated out of Passau, a little city northeast of Munich in, in Germany. Um, it was here that they kept weapons from three complete armies, the Hungarian 5th Army, the German 5th Army, and the German 12th Army. They were all in an American-run depot. $10 million worth of these materials went missing, were sold by black marketers, mainly Odessa agents, German officials, and criminals, aided by a few Allied soldiers. And one of the greatest ironies of history, the bulk of this material was being shipped to Palestine for use both by Jews trying to create the state of Israel and by Arabs who violently opposed such an effort. So back then they started aiding in what is still going on today, a genocide of Jews. Holy shit. And you can't talk about it because as we'll get in to Israel's influence on the world, there's multiple states, Abby, Abby Martin's in a lawsuit. It is illegal to criticize Israel um, on official institutional grounds of certain colleges in states like Georgia is one of them. At that hmm. college, she gave a speech. It's illegal to criticize Israel. And is, that's uh, Israel. Is Louisiana or Colorado one of those states? I'm not sure, but there. Maybe uh, Abby Martin. Say. Yeah, Abby Martin uh, said a number. I think it was like 23 total states. This is a large Holy number. shit. That's like. And it's unconstitutional for a foreign country to change our laws benefiting them. And Israel did. So fucking, uh, you know, moving on. That's wild shit. Yeah. Um, so in January 5th, 1947, intelligence officers under the command of William Weaver of General Patton's G2 staff were sent to pass on to make arrests. Instead, the agents were murdered and the house in which they were staying was burned. Millionaires were made immediately after the war by both surplus and black market arms deals, but none were to achieve the profitability of Odessa, whose agents ranged throughout Europe and even behind the Iron Curtain, explained Manning. And he added... They bought and sold surplus American arms to Arab buyers, seeking to strengthen the military capabilities of Egypt and other Middle Eastern Arab nations. Palestine was to be partitioned into a Jewish homeland, and they intended to destroy it at birth. So basically, we're going to give the Jews what they want, a home, but from the get-go, you're fucked. We're going to make sure you So it's kind of like this thing, like, we're going to get you all back into the one spot and then exterminate you when you get all there. Right. Yeah. It's the idea behind yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And like, it was that warehouse specifically that, that, cause you know, if you were to tell the story to somebody, they'd be like, that's bullshit. Well, you can give them specifics. Like it was this warehouse and these armies weapons, this much worth $10 million was stolen by those Odessa agents and sold to Palestine and Jews in what, 1945 that was? 1945. Yeah. 47. 45. They sold the weapons. Mm. So, um, but now Jewish buyers, so they were selling to the, the Arabs who wanted to strengthen Egypt and the Middle East and the Levant. Remember when we talked about the Levant? Yeah. That whole last area. episode, yeah. Um, so, but now Jewish buyers funded from America and elsewhere entered the marketplace. They were barred from purchasing guns and American surplus P-51 Mustang fighter planes by President Truman, and their only recourse for survival was to trade on the European black market, which, unknown to them, was rapidly coming under the control of Odessa agents. However, the Jewish agency's buyers might have purchased from the devil himself if it meant survival of the small, defenseless nation just come into being May 14th, 1947. Again, uh, 
The maneuvering of wealthy globalists can be seen in the creation of modern Israel. It began in 1917. Um, we're getting to the end of this segment. Let's check this shit out. In 1917, second Baron Rothschild, Lionel Walter Rothschild, received a letter from British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour replying to his query regarding Balfour's position on Palestine. Basically, what's the deal over there, Balfour? Are we good? Balfour said, we're good. That letter became known as the Balfour Declaration. In 1922, the League of Nations approved the Balfour Mandate in Palestine, paving the way for the later creation of Israel. Lord Rothschild was an ardent Zionist who had served as a member of the British Parliament. The Zionist movement, composed of both Jews and non-Jews, had been working toward the creation of Israel since the late 1800s. Lord Rothschild was the eldest son of Nathan Rothschild, who's like that. Nathan Rothschild is the hoist Gracie of all the Gracie brothers, all the Rothschild. He controlled the Bank of England and funded the Cecil Rhodes Diamond Empire. Another Rothschild, Baron Edmund de Rothschild, built the first pipeline from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean and founded the Israel Bank. He was called the father of modern Israel. I would have never thought the Rothschilds had anything to do with the homeland of Jesus' people. It also appears that Zionists employed blackmail to aid in the formation of Israel. Their most famous target was Nelson Rockefeller, who in 1940 was named to the intelligence position of coordinator of inter-American affairs by Secretary of Defense Forrestal, James V. Forrestal. In 1944, Rockefeller was selected to serve as Assistant Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs. So Rockefeller becomes the Secretary of State mm. in Latin America. Okay, this is where it got getting a little where interesting. All these Nazis are hanging out. Yeah, it was it was a post most suitable whose primary purpose for Rockefeller, according to authors Loftus and Ahrens, was quote to monopolize Latin America's raw materials and exclude the Europeans. Due to the extensive business dealings between the German Nazis and American globalists, as detailed previously, they noted. During the war, the Germans in South America got anything they wanted. The Europeans had to pay cash. Behind Rockefeller's rhetoric of taking measures in Latin America for their national defense stood a naked grab for profits. So again, we're, we're just like all the satellites and Starlink. We're bringing internet to third world countries so we right. can help them. Oh, fuck yeah. Tesla needs to make a coup in Tasmania so we can rob the mountains of lithium so we can help Zimbabwe fucking shop on Amazon. So, Here, anyway, go ahead. Under the cloak of this position, Rockefeller and his cronies would take over Britain's most valuable Latin American properties. If the British resisted, he would block materials getting there, like sanctions and shit. Soon he controlled, Rockefeller controlled much of South America and was able to bring that influence to the newly created United Nations. Rockefeller got all the way into the United Nations, dude. This oh, book shit. also go this book also goes into the departments of health and shit that the Rockefellers created in the government and talks about how they went from homeopathy to allopathy. Basically homeopathy was therapy involving minor doses of drugs to help psychiatry, like people with problems. Right. They discovered that drugs like Prozac can get you deeper into the mind. That's when things turn into allopathy where they just straight up treat crazy people with drugs. It's not therapy. That was a Rockefeller Nazi thing that gets into MK Ultra mind control. And that's today's thing is just drugs. There's no, it's getting back to homeopathy with people like Joe Rogan who were like big voices and pushing healthy shit. Isn't that yeah. wild, dude? That's wild. I thought homeopathy was old school shit. Like, no, that's actually the way to do it. Nazis fucked it up and we're living in that system. There's a whole chapter on how the big pharmaceutical industry. Man, what's the name of this book? The Rise of the Fourth Reich by Jim Mars. The Rise of the Fourth Reich. So I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. All right. So uh, Rockefeller's partner in money making was John Foster Dulles. 
He was a trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation and a conspirator in smuggling access money. His brother, Alan Dulles, was the head of the Warren Commission. Did you know Alan Dulles communicated directly to his superior, Heinrich Himmler, mm -hmm. through another yeah. guy? Dude, yeah. he was a, he's a Nazi. That Alan Dulles, as the OSS station chief in Bern, Switzerland, sat at the nexus of U.S. intelligence as well as Soviet intelligence, such as the infamous Ruth Capel or Red Orchestra spy network. It was during his stint as assistant to the U.S. ambassador that Dulles used SS Brigadier, Brigadier, Fuhrer, Brigadier General Walter Schellenberg to communicate with his immediate superior, Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler. On the Warren Commission. Imagine being alive in the 70s and you're believing what Alan Dulles is telling you. Because, you know, you believe the institution, follow the science, right? And right. little do you know, he's straight up a Nazi. Heinrich Himmler, he's so yeah, crazy, so man. Check this part out. Dulles constantly sent intelligence reports to Washington, although, as stated by Adam Labor, there are questions as to whether his motive was supplying genuine economic intelligence or merely building a complicated empire of information and disinformation that reached from Bern to Berlin and back again. Mm. Crazy, dude. So in 1947, Zionist leader David Ben-Gurion needed votes to ensure the passage of a UN resolution partitioning Palestine and creating the state of Israel. He turned to Rockefeller. So they're getting to the point where they need votes to make the partition of Palestine. Mm -hmm. Rockefeller was a guy. This is... This is it right here. According to several U.S. intelligence agents, Ben Gurion, quote, blackmailed the hell out of him. Rockefeller was able to deflect several investigations into his family's pre-war and wartime dealings with the Nazis. But according to Loftus and Aarons, the Jews arrived with their dossier. So he got busted by the Jews. He got cornered. They had his Swiss bank records with the Nazis, his signature on correspondence setting up the German cartel in South America, transcripts of his convos with Nazi agents during the war, and finally, evidence of his complicity <clears throat> in helping Alan Dulles smuggle Nazi war criminals and money from the Vatican to Argentina. Mm -hmm. Um... Uh, with unprecedented access to classified CIA and NATO files, as well as former intelligence operatives. Uh, Mark Ahrens produced a book called The Secret War Against the Jews. And in that book, he gave this account. You ready for this, dude? Ready. This, is, this is what I've been building up to right here. One of the four topics. Rockefeller skimmed through the dossier and coolly began to bargain. In return for the votes of the Latin American bloc, because he runs Latin America and they need their votes for Palestine. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, you want these votes? He wanted guarantees that the Jews would keep their mouths shut about the flow of Nazi money and fugitives to South America. There would be no Zionist Nazi hunting, no testimony at Nuremberg about the bankers or anyone else, not a single leak to the press about where the Nazis were living in South America or which Nazis were working for Dulles. Hmm. The subject of Nazis was closed, period, forever. The choice was simple, Rockefeller explained. You can have vengeance or you can have a country, but you can't have both. The deal was made and Rockefeller delivered. On November 29, 1947, the UN General Assembly approved a resolution recommending the partition of Palestine. The vote shocked the Arab world, which had not foreseen several Latin American countries switching their vote at the last minute. The Jews traded silence for their new country's security, but they didn't take it lying down. To this day, to this day, to this day, right, Israel, okay. <laughs> to this day, Israeli leaders have in turn blackmailed the Western employers of Nazi refugees and war criminals, guaranteeing nearly unconditional support for Israel and its policies. That's when Israel started their blackmail campaign because it's the only way for them to get the power back from being fucked. And it's, it, was, it was aimed at Western employers of Nazi refugees. Now we get to Epstein, the Israeli temple on his island, the blackmail network, Israel. Israel's oh, policies taken over our... Dude, you know what I'm talking about, man? 1947. 
Holy shit. Vatican, escape Nazis, Rockefeller, Latin America, Palestine, the weapons that they're fighting each other with still. Who's funding them still? What the yeah, fuck? Giving weapons to both sides. That's this is all fucked. Dude. That's just like part of one chapter. Whoa. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. That's wild, dude. Yeah, so they got more. Can we keep going? Sure. Um, that's it for that chapter. I'm getting into the next one. We can flow through this. I do have a, I got to go get some medicine for my dog but before the vet's office closes at five. So what just, time is it there? 356. Four. Oh, damn. Okay. Well, let's keep rolling. We'll finish it. Yeah, we got this. Yeah. So, I mean, I found, a, a, I thought I was reading from the same book because I found this article that was extracted from the book Secret Societies That Threaten to Take Over America by Jay Mars. And it went down, you know, the list of topics that you sent me in that text message pretty much one after the other after the other. So um, I can pull some information from here too. Uh, I know you uh, want to get through some of the book, but... No, go ahead. I'm finding where my next spot is. I got everything highlighted. I'm just like, I don't want to... I got extra shit highlighted so I can take a minute to make sure I, you're good. So we talked about the Alan Dulles and basically his, his connection with uh, the Nazis. Um, the move of the Nazis over to the U S was part of, uh, it was originally called, not project, it was Operation Overcast and eventually became Project Paperclip and then renamed something different, I think the National Interest Project or something along those lines later on. But this article, which you can find online and is free, um, if you just search Project Paperclip in the space race, you should be able to find it with that. This breaks down basically everyone who was involved and gives you an overview of how the Nazis were kind of pulling strings both in the U.S. and the Soviet Union because they were given asylum in both. And it was basically this race between the two superpowers that were remaining at the time. To oh, It appeared that it was a race to basically gather up all of those Nazi scientists to come out ahead in all different sectors of technolo technology because the Nazis were way ahead in, in uh, aeronautics and rocketry um, bioweapons and things along those lines. So the U S and the Soviets all were basically fighting to get, and in fact, there was a joke running at the time during the space race. It was like, well, our Nazis are better than your Nazis. There was like a running joke that like the cartoonist would use, uh, at the time. So I thought that was kind of crazy, but there's evidence that the Nazis that were in both of those programs and in, in those different sectors were actually communicating together. And then there were people at a higher tier that were doing things to put on this front as if there was this cold war that was actually happening. But in reality, they were working together in the background. So, um, anyway, that's a little setup. I'm sure your book goes into some of that stuff. I'm yeah. going to find some of the corresponding passages for that. I'm yeah. kind of calling them out as we're going along here. Um, did you find your place? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, so they started uh, hiring Nazis. Um, the pay-per-click the paperclip office operated out of the intelligence division's headquarters in Heidelberg under director Colonel Robert Shaw, who would become assistant director of the CIA in 1949. Hunt wrote in his book, Secret Agenda. She said that 
officers at the Joint Intelligence Objectives Agency who managed Project Paperclip soon began receiving security reports from Show's office regarding the Germans recruited into the program. All reports on these men had been altered from a determination of ardent Nazi to read non-ardent Nazi. So they literally just... Just changed, changed it. Like, all right, all of these people, they weren't Nazis. They were just, they're just regular yeah. German citizens. Yeah, people who before were like, dangerous to put to the public um i think the next the the i don't think i don't know if this was go ahead uh, I, I think the next sentence is kind of crazy too in her book um i don't know if this is in yours as well but it says after assuming the directorship of the newly created cia alan dulles who as attorney for schroeder bank had brokered the deals allowing hitler's rise to power assume control over Operation Paperclip and increase the flow of National Socialists into the United States. So I, I didn't realize that about Alan Dulles. He's just a fucking grimy dude. Yeah. Top to bottom, all the way around. I didn't realize that he, uh, that, that fact about him, right, that he worked as an attorney for that bank that, that basically brokered deals for Hitler. Yeah. And this book talks about John J. McCloy a lot because he was said uh, all this activity was arrested in the hands of certain top-ranking government officials like the Dulles Brothers and John J. McCloy. Did you watch Oliver Stone's new documentary about JFK? No. Because they had like a a file dump in 2005, and now all the journalists have compiled the information, so stuff's coming out about that. But that's what his documentary is on is like, he basically closes the book and kind of answers a lot of questions on JFK. But there's a part in there where John J. McCloy, who is on the the Warren Commission, was interviewed on the Walter Cronkite show. And it was found out after that John J. McCloy paid off the guy who was going to interview him to not ask him anything about JFK. Once that was found out after, because Cronkite didn't know that little deal happened, that guy was fired. And if you watch the documentary, he's like, he's like the side guy, like the guy that's at the end of the desk with the microphone, like actual yeah. guy in the show. So like that's how the media works. John J. McCloy is mentioned in all this, and he was on the Warren Commission with Della. So like a lot of these guys, they're just up at the top of the government acting like American officials and people are like, but they're passionate about their job. That's why he's there. It's like, they're fucking Nazis, bro. They pay the media to lie. <laughs> like they pay like the media. Literally Nazis, like literally Nazis. Yeah. Um, also the CIA was Nazi made in 1947. What was that? Um, Another program named Project 63 was to get German scientists out of Europe. Most went to work for universities or defense contractors, not the U.S. government. Thus, the American taxpayer footed the bill for a project to help former Nazis obtain jobs with Lockheed Martin, Marietta, North American Aviation, and other defense contractors during a time when many American engineers in the aircraft industry were laid off. So these Nazis were taking our jobs that weren't even for the government. It was big private corporations bringing them in, another bypassing of bureaucracy and how big companies work. And they were taking jobs at an average of like $2,000 cheaper in salary because it was more than the Germans were originally getting yeah, paid. Yeah, they weren't getting shit. And the American employers were being laid off because they could pay for cheaper labor. And the Germans got security clearance in the CIA and our government faster and easier than the American workers. So like these Germans just took over and it was private companies that allowed yeah. it. The government was like, just like... Lockheed... W.R. Grace and Company, CBS Laboratories, Martin Marietta. Hey, bring it back to the Doomsday Clock. Um, in a 1985 expose in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, Hunt wrote that she had examined more than 130 reports on Project Paperclip subjects, and every one had been changed to eliminate this security threat classification. Mm. President Truman, who had explicitly ordered no committed Nazis to be ad admitted under Project Paperclip, was evidently never aware that his directive had been violated. Anyway, the both that bulletin of atomic scientists, man, they're calling they're calling bullshit on the media. So yeah, yeah, I'm actually surprised because that's <clears> the that's in, actually in this book too. Quote the quote 
that's in the book. So I'm, I'm surprised with the bullet of atomic science, but the same thing with the Walter Cronkite show, it can be a, a reliable thing because Walter Cronkite, Cronkite was re, uh, legit, but when they need to use these orms for propaganda, they do like they will. Yeah. John J. McCloy paid the guy. So if you're a conspiracy theorist and you're like, he lied on Walter Cronkite, <clears throat> like, no, Walter Cronkite is true. It's like, sometimes it's not. Um, can I read just a little bit here? So Paperclip yeah, had several spinoff projects. Uh, expanding on Paperclip, the National Interest Program was tightly connected to the new CIA and provided a means of bypassing close scrutiny by anti-Nazi elements within military intelligence. No longer were Nazi scientists the sole objective. Recruitment of Nazis now included Eastern Europeans thought to be helpful against the communist and even convicted nazi war criminals anyone regardless of their past was eligible as long as someone within the as long as someone within the u.s government deemed their presence in the national interest wow so if i worked in the government i thought that there was a nazi that i could uh bullshit my way into saying this was here to protect our national interest i could get them in and get them these security clearances faster than i could in america um, so I'm going into the space race part. So I think uh, I'm done with paperclip right now. Okay. Um, the flow of information between the scientists in the Soviet Union and the United States led some researchers to suspect that a covert space program, a third program, was in effect. Joseph P. Farrell, who holds a doctorate degree degree in patristics, the study of early Christian writers and their work from the University of Oxford, also researched ancient history and physics to include the space program. In his 2004 book, Reich, Reich of the Black Sun, he wrote, it is perhaps significant that some contemporary observers of the American space program and its odd 30-year-long holding pattern and tapestry of inconsistencies, lies, and obfuscations have long suspected that there are indeed two space programs inside the U.S. government, the public NASA one and the quasi-independent one based deep within covert and black projects. To understand how this control of parallel programs worked, one must look past the Eisenhower administration and study the National Security Act of 1947. Mm. On September 15th of that year, only three months after pilot Kenneth Arnold saw flying disks over Mount Rainier, and just two months after something crashed near Roswell, New Mexico, President Harry S. Truman signed into the law the National Security Act of 1947, which, among other things, created the National Security Council and the Air Force as a separate branch of service, united the military branches under a Department of Defense, and created America's first peacetime civilian intelligence organization, the, the CIA. CIA. So in 19 1947, we had UFOs, we had the NSA, the NSC, the CIA, the creation of Israel. All this stuff is happening. Moving on. The NSC staff is directed by the president's security advisor. Um, to, co to coordinate covert operations, the NSC recreated the uh, created the 5412 committee, also called the Special Group, which has changed the name several times to avoid public exposure. In 64, it was known as the 303 Committee, and in 1970, it was renamed the 40 Committee. Within this organization, which includes such familiar names as Nelson Rockefeller, Rockefeller. Ro Robert McNamara, McGeorge, Bundy, Gordon Gray, and Alan Dulles, inside that committee was a subcommittee dealing with science and technology. It is here that the connection between the corporate and financial world and government held technological secrets may be found. Here is centered control over rocketry, space, alternative energy sources, and even UFOs. It is here that researchers have tracked the mysterious group known as Magic 12, Majestic 12, or MJ 12. MJ-12 was first publicly raised in 84 when a TV producer and UFO researcher received an undeveloped roll of 35mm black and white film in his mail. The film contained eight pages of what appeared to be official U.S. government documents stamped top secret, magic eyes only, and dated November 18th, 1952. The pages were a briefing document prepared for President-elect Dwight D. Eisenhower concerning Operation Majestic 12. There has been ongoing controversy over the legitimacy of these and the subsequent release of other MJ-12 documents, including the Standard Operations Manual, SOM-101, marked Top Secret slash Magic, and titled Extraterrestrial Entities and Technology Recovery and Disposal. 
The papers went on to detail how a secret operation was begun on July 7th, 1947, to recover the wreckage of a disc-shaped craft from the site approximately 70 miles northwest northwest of Roswell. Four small human-like beings who apparently ejected from the craft were found dead two miles east of the site. The document added civilian and military witnesses in the area were debriefed and news reporters were given the effective cover story. The object had been a misguided weather research balloon. Um, now, later, the weather balloon story became discredited. They changed it to a Mago balloon, blah, blah, blah. We know the story. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the briefing papers stated... Uh, well, that's not important. Let's move on from that. So, all that's happening. There's a list of like the MJ12 members here on my screen. Um, you can oh, read yeah. through these. I'll Roscoe get to those. H. They're actually coming up right after this. Okay. But just real quick, the MJ-12 documents created a storm of controversy within the UFO community. Debunkers claim to have found all sorts of discrepancies from misspellings to identical signatures. However, no one has been able to de definitively disprove all the MJ-12 documents as fakes. And in fact, there's much evidence to indicate their authenticity. For example, Dr. Robert M. Wood, who managed in research development at McDonnell, McDonnell, McDonnell Douglas for 43 years, found that the typeface and style of SOM-1 101, uh, the standard operations manual, matched the U.S. government printing press used in, during the 1950s. So it's very likely that the MJ-12 documents are a real government thing. Right. Um, and the fact that it came out when it did. Which is uh, after all, everyone that's listed here, as far as the members, had already died. If the information in MJ-12 documents is proven correct, it's strong evidence that certain persons in the United States had access to remarkable technology, both taken at Roswell and similar to that described as being in Nazi hands towards the end of the war. One of these guys, um, when he died, they believe it signaled to somebody higher up to release the MJ-12 files. That because guy was... And by the time it came out, they were all dead. And it came out right after he... Was it Forrestal? Uh, no, Jerome Hunsacker. Mm. Many feel that Hunsacker's death may have signaled to someone in the official world that it is now permissible to leak MJ-12 Eisenhower briefing document. Yeah. All right, so... he was the last one to die that was part of that list. What they all had in common was these men were connected to high levels of national security uh, and American corporate business. The agenda of this control group, listen to this, may, oh, this have been, crazy. may have been expressed by Senator Lyndon B. Johnson, who's speaking to the Senate Democratic Caucus on January 7th, 1958, stated, quote, Control of space means control of the world. From space, the masters of infinity would have the power to control the Earth's weather, to cause drought and flood, to change the tides and raise the levels of the sea, to divert the Gulf Stream and change the climate to frigid. There is something more powerful than the ultimate weapon that is the ultimate position the position of total control over the earth that lies somewhere in outer space a lagrange point maybe Mm. And if there is an ultimate position, then our national goal and the goal of all free men must be to win and hold that position. Johnson wrote, um, George W. Bush in 07 echoed his remarks by calling for new space, mis space missions and the weaponization of space. And we see that still happening. But remember, Adding those to Johnson's puzzling statement about the masters of infinity are facts indicating an astounding connection between the well-documented occultism of the Nazis, the NASA space program, and the Soviet space program. That's my book, bro. You found the book online for free. Why'd I buy no. it? Richard C. Hoagland, a former science advisor to Walter Cronkite and CBS news during the Apollo program astounded conspiracy researchers in the 90s with his assertion that the time and date of many NASA space launches, including the Apollo moon missions, were set to coincide with astrological alignments of the stars and planets. In 92, Hoagland briefed UN officials on the mathematical and geometric linkage connecting the sitting of the Sidonia on Mars, which is the location of the Martian pyramids in face, with the Egyptian location of the pyramids and the Sphinx on Earth. I think that was sighting. Huh? Sighting, not sitting, I think. Sighting on the... Connecting the sighting... 
whatever. This remarkable new evidence that is all we have thought regarding NASA is distinctly different from the NASA imagery that I've analyzed for almost 15 years, reported Hoagland. This new evidence is of a pattern shown by an official undeniable log of NASA mission planning, mission priorities, and space agency decisions extending back to when the agency was officially formed by act of Congress on July 29, 1958. The log has been carefully compiled from recorded network mission broadcast from, among others, my old network, CBS, officially published national mission timelines and documented testimonials of former NASA scientists. So that's wild shit that they basically um, timed the launches around yeah. astrological um, events, you know, that in then you had a Boeing engineer, Marianne Weaver, which I know you're going to get into. That was that heard this from uh, Hoagland. And oh wait, did her own research on it. I think before that, um, I had something highlighted right after what you read. Um, according to Hoagland, these cross-correlated public records now provide firm evidence of an astonishing official link between NASA's supposedly strict scientific missions and millennia-old occult beliefs. In fact, the original official NASA Apollo lunar program logo of the 60s clearly depicted the belt and the constellation of Orion, long thought to represent Osiris, Osiris, a central figure in Egyptian celestial mythology. Curiously, immediately after the Apollo 13 accident, remember we talked about that? Mm -hmm. um, NASA quietly changed this Apollo program logo, adding random stars to the existing constellation, thereby cleverly obscuring its direct derivation from Orion. Um, far from being merely represented by this interesting Egyptian mythological connection, it was in fact completely controlled and by designed around this crucial Orion symbolism. In other words, someone with enough authority to set the launch date and time for an Apollo mission, as well as many others, was guided by the astrological alignment of the stars and planets rather than objective scientific basis. So... Um, it says, imagine the astonishment you'd feel if you learned that Apollo 11's historic lunar touchdown took place at the one location on the entire lunar surface called Tranquility, and within minutes of an entire solar year, 8.17 p.m. GMT, July 20th, 1969, where and when Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, and the central stellar figure, Isis, in the Egyptian triumvirate of Isis, Osiris, and Horus, could have been seen hovering above the airless eastern horizon, precisely at 19.5 degrees elevation. But this is exactly what happened. So, like, they timed it with the rising of Sirius on That's the moon. Wild. Yeah. And there's more evidence because, like, what you were saying about Marianne Weaver, she said she was a Boeing engineer and all that. She researched this and she said they must have, they must happen by design to try and explain them via random processes results in odds of billions to one. I would not bet on the random side of these kinds of odds. That's yeah. It's fucking wild. Yeah. And then uh, Michael Barra pointed disturbing similarity with r Russian space flights. He noticed the launch of the first module, of the international space station was launched, uh, from Kazakhstan, now an independent border that borders Russia and the Kazakhstan Museum, was apparently designed to coincide with a number of the significant celestial alignments already found in NASA's long-established ritual pattern. This would indicate some connection between the former Soviet space program and NASA, perhaps through the Nazi scientists working in both. Wild shit. Yeah. So... President John F. Kennedy may have been aware of a parallel space program and decided to make it public policy. On November 12, 1963, 10 days before its assassination, he instructed NASA Administrator James Webb. The James, yeah, the James Webb Telescope just got launched, dude. Special point in place. The James Webb Telescope's going to a Lagrange point. Uh, it's kind of weird. Yep. Um, he instructed NASA Administrator James Webb to develop a program of joint space and lunar exploration with the Soviet Union. And I passed this up a while back. Passed this up a while back. Soon, I gotta, yeah. I got to make it before they close at five. Literally just made it to the end, but there's just one more thing. You good? Um, but basically, during the space race, um, there was an there was an off upper there was an office in Germany, a US office in Germany where German scientists were communicating 
um, in America, they were using it to communicate to Russia and America. Secretly. Yeah, it was like the central point in West yeah. Germany. And the space were. race between Russia and America to us appeared like a race, but it was actually coordinated by the Nazis who yeah, were controlling every, information so that Russia could launch something. But like first, we had, we had the yeah. technology in a hangar and we couldn't do it until we got the go ahead, which was yeah, after we Russia. production of the multi-stage rockets. To, yeah, there you go. Um, like we ordered the, the stop of them. So the, and then the Russians were able to launch first. And you have officers in the military that are basically saying that's bullshit. We basically gave them the keys to Sputnik um, when we could have been the first ones to beat them to space. So there was some coordination happening at the highest level of government there. Here's the paragraph. President Truman was once notified by the CIA that the Nazi scientists working for the Soviets were using a postal address in the U.S. sector of West Germany as a cover for communications with the paperclip scientists in America. One general electric manager working with paperclip specialists told the FBI that the Army's lax security at White Sands Proving Grounds bordered on criminal neglect, especially since about 350 of the Germans' former co-workers were serving the Russians. He believed that it was reasonable to assume that friendly contacts between the two groups still existed. Apparently, overseas communication between the Nazis in America and the Nazis in Russia continued unabated, which raised the possibility of a parallel space race. Did you read this already? Probably. Or manipulated by the very globalists who created and financed both the communism and the Third Reich. And the very last thing, the very last thing, um, some strong evidence suggests they may well be the subject of this book. Those global national socialists and their minions who have a goal of controlling the entire world. Nicholas Nick Rockefeller, a participant in the World Economic Forum, member mm. of the Council on Foreign Relations and the International Institute for Strategic Studies, may have revealed the overall globalist agenda when he said, quote, the end goal is to get everybody chipped to control the whole society, to have the bankers and the elite people control the world. Wow. That is fucking terrifying. So why did I bring all that up? Because the world was like that in 1947. A lot of stuff happened in 1947. And I personally don't think it was necessarily an altruistic thing for these scientists to create a doomsday clock. Because to me... According to Lyndon B. Johnson, who said that they want to control space and the weather, and ch you know what I'm saying, like yeah. somebody knows something, and I think I think this is my thought: the doomsday clock is like a propaganda arm to condition the masses. Once a year, there's an update, doomsday clock. Um, so we're just expecting it. That's all. We're just expecting to kill ourselves by these things, and it's like. That is, the, that is the criticism of the doomsday clock. Is that, is that why have a doomsday clock at all? Why put the public at a certain amount of panic at all? And then the, the consortium of scientists would argue that its intention is to, when needed, put the necessary pressure on world leaders yeah. to make the decisions to protect humanity. And there were a number of scientists that put it into motion after the atomic bomb. So there, it very well could have been like, oh shit, we got to keep the public yeah. aware. And you see, they've done a couple things that go against the narrative, right? You said Oppenheimer was a guy that started it. Wasn't he the guy working in the Manhattan Project? Yeah, one of them. Well, he was, yeah. he's a contributor. He's not, uh, it, it's a rotating thing. He was a contributor to it. Yeah. So, so I just, I simply asked the question, is the doomsday clock part of all that stuff we just talked about or is Possibly. it a genuine thing made by genuine people? It all happened people? in 1947. So, I mean, they got nice you, shirts. You, Yeah. The merch store is nice. Yeah, it is. All right, bro. I got to go pick up some medicine for my dog. So she's uh good. Give Belle a little get before five. Get a little, give her a little rebel in the snout for me. I will. All right, I will, man. man. She's getting old. All right, man. I'll see you uh, later on. Yeah, see you. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Check out our bands. Look below yep. for the links. Album release this uh, Friday. Check it out. Go Gotham. Yeah. Right on. Peace, people. Uh, drive safe. Later.